part two of The New Thing by Trisha Tillen. This is called The Latter Rain Roots. Introduction. Let me begin with these two statements referring to the present renewal. Quote, this move of the Spirit in 1994 is not just a charismatic and Pentecostal experience concerning power or gifting. It is one thing to be clothed with power. It is another thing to to be indwelt with the person of God." The first Pentecost caused individual believers to be clothed with power from on high. The second Pentecost, as this present renewal is called, seems to be all about the incarnation of Christ into his body as a whole. The evidence for this can be found in many documents, letters, articles, and books coming from the renewal leadership. The important thing in understanding what is happening in the church today is to grasp at a deeper level the theological background and historical roots of this movement. Once that is done, the rest is easy. Everything falls into place. Here is the second quote. Restoration is the work of the Spirit to bring us personally, the church corporately, and finally the world universally back to its original purity, Eden. Revival is the derelict temple quickly swept clean, speedily built up, and dramatically filled with glory. From the revived church will come displays of glory, works of power, fruits for the world, and salvation for the nations. Unquote. These are claims being made for the present outpouring. Clearly, there is an agenda. This is not just a refreshing, but the events now taking place have a goal, a purpose. What do the leaders talk about the temple being filled and Christ returning to the church as the glory cloud to indwell his body corporately? These concepts are not biblical and have never been part of traditional church doctrine. The teachings have come into the charismatic church, especially the restoration movement from the latter rain revival of the 1940s. They can also be traced back earlier to awakenings in the 19th century. Pause. I will link this article below. There is a long list of footnotes for all these quotes. The Charismatic Movement, an expansion of the latter rain movement. Firstly, how has the latter rain revival come to influence Pentecostals and Charismatics today. Most Christians think that particular movement died out in the 1950s when it, when it was banished from the Pentecostal denominations. However, the latter rain doctrines did not die. They just went underground, as this quote from Bill Heyman's book, The Eternal Church, illustrates. Bill Heyman traces spiritual movements that he believes restored the church progressively from its dark ages. He comes to the fourth doctrine restored, that of the laying on of hands, not for healing, but for the transference of the anointing and gifts. Quote, the laying on of hands produced another major movement. This movement started in the late 1940s and infiltrated into every Pentecostal group in the 1950s. During this time, it was known as the Latter Rain and Revival Movement. In the early 1960s, very few Christians were knowledgeable of the movement except Pentecostal churches, which had been affected by it. However, in the mid-1960s, the Holy Spirit had spread the truths and spiritual experiences of the Restoration Doctrine into every church groups within Christendom. The move of the Spirit, which took the four Restoration Doctrines of Hebrews 6, 1, and 2, and made them known to all church denominations and independent groups became known as the Charismatic Movement. Notice how Bill Heyman names the latter rain revelations, such as the transference of the Spirit and gifts as part of the Restoration Doctrines, and he says these continued to operate within the Charismatic Movement right up to the present times. It was the Charismatic Movement that provided a home for latter rain teachings according to its own proponents. What we are dealing with in the Vineyard Movement, in the Toronto Blessing, in the Kansas City Prophets, and to a very large extent 
in the kingdom, dominion, or restoration movement is a resurgence of the old latter reign heresies. Although it appears to some that the charismatic movement spawned a teaching called restoration, in fact, this doctrine was alive and well long before and simply transplanted itself into the fertile soil of the charismatic renewal of the 1960s. Later, we shall see precisely how that happened and what effect it had. Latter Rain Beliefs The Latter Rain teachings cover a very wide spectrum of doctrines, and different ministers teach different aspects. Some are more extreme than others. Also, leaders are not open about holding these teachings because they are afraid of losing support, and they believe these new revelations are only for the elite so it is difficult to find out who believes what. Paul Van Der Selt, in an email to Richard Riss, who had circulated a robust defense of the Latter Ring Revival, made this revealing statement. Quote, I consider one of the most important events in the history of God's restora restorative plan. It is, the e it is the least understood, but has, the mo has had a profound effect on many of the present ministry involved in what God is doing today. The word of the Lord that came out of that revival continues to reverberate and influence Christians worldwide. It seems like the streams that flowed out from that divine encounter, i.e. restoration, sonship, kingdom life, and immortality messages, etc., have remained on the fringes of the mainstream church. However, many leaders have been profoundly influenced by this revival but have not endorsed it, nor have they made explicit references to it because of the controversies and misunderstanding of what God actually did during those times. Unquote. After the latter reign became somewhat a of a scandal within Pentecostal churches in the 1950s, ministers were wary of admitting their beliefs. They hunkered down and got on with their lives, while secretly holding to the new revelations and passing them on to others. Many of those involved in the original latter rain revival ended up as leading figures in the charismatic world and remain there to this day. Thus the teachings survived and now have re-emerged with fresh vigor. We can sum up the latter rain or dominion teachings this way. The church must be restored and equipped to rule by the five-fold ministries. It must come to perfection and complete visible unity. Out of the purified church will come a spiritual elite corp, a corporate Christ who possesses the spirit without measure. They will purge the earth of all wickedness and rebellion. They will judge the apostate church. They will judge the apostate church, which is everyone else besides them. They will redeem all creation and restore the earth. They will eventually overcome death itself in a counterfeit of the rapture. The church will thus inherit the earth and rule over it from the throne of Christ. Looking at these teachings, it is obvious that what we call dominionism or restoration doctrine is actually the latter rain doctrines warmed over. Let's look now at how the root of these teachings took to enter the mainline churches. New Thingology In part one of this study, we looked at the Gnostic heresy that produced certain results in church doctrines over the ages, notably the search for new revelations to reveal hidden spiritual meaning that would unlock a deeper life for Christians. The Gnostic doctrine is ever seeking for a new thing, a new revelation that will give power in it and release from the fallen material world. Bear this in mind as it provides a key to understanding the Toronto and Brownsville teachings. When the Apostle Paul was in Athens, he came up against certain philosophers. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. 
Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and foreigners who were there spent their time nothing in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. That's Acts 17, 18 through 21. It was the desire of pagan and later Christian philosophers and mystics to seek out a new thing. The revelation given once for all in Jesus Christ was somehow not enough for these seekers, and they ever looked for more, more. However, Scripture tells us very plainly, there is no hidden new thing to, to come to light. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. Ecclesiastes 1, 9 and 10. God has provided the revelation of the truth to mankind in and through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the truth, God incarnate. Searching for some additional key to understanding the universe is fruitless. In any case, God does not deal in secret wisdom, but all that he does is open and available to all. Seek and ye shall find. New things, scriptures misquoted. Here it is the new thing as defined by Clayt Sunmore, Thy Kingdom Come Ministries, in his book, Beyond Pentecost. Quote, this new thing God is bringing forth is the merging of God and man, not seen in fullness since the separation of man from God in the Garden of Eden, with the possible exception of Enoch and Elijah. Unquote. For many years, scriptures referring to a new thing have undergirded the belief in an end times global revival, a latter rain outpouring that will bring the corporate church to fullness, glory and rulership, However, we examine these scriptures. When we examine these scriptures, it becomes apparent that the new thing spoken of in scripture is actually the astounding birth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, become human. Quote, How long will you gad about, O you backsliding daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall encompass a man. Jeremiah 30, 31, 22. The totally unprecedented and new event that only God could create was the birth by a virgin of the Son of God, a human woman encompassed in her womb the divinity. Who could have invented such a thing? This was so new that those who were told it, the Old Testament people of God, did not understand it. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Isaiah 42.9 <clears throat> Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. This is the passage often quoted by those who believe in the new thingology. They read this allegorically to mean that God will send an unprecedented global outpouring of His Spirit in the end times to bring the church to glory and the world to salvation. But if you look at the passage as a whole, you'll find out it's not about the church, it's about the Jews and the Messiah. Reading verse 19 in context, we see that the subject is the former deliverance of the Jews from Egypt, overshadowed by the latter deliverance from the exile in Babylon. One commentator says of this passage, God reminds them of the great things he did for their fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. He that did this can, if he please, make a way in the sea when they return out of Babylon. The best exposition of this is from Jeremiah 16 and 23. It shall no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. That is an old thing, the remembrance of which will be in a manner lost in the new thing. Is the new proof that the Lord liveth, for he brought up the children out of Israel, out of the land of the north. 
This passage looks forward prophetically to an even greater restoration of Israel in the 20th century, and spiritually it refers to the deliverance of mankind from captivity to sin by the devil, by the birth and death of Jesus Christ, where the new thing is the new covenant in his blood. Nothing in the passage is prophetic of a latter rain revival, new thingology is the bedrock of revival teaching, yet it fa falls at the first fence. Latter rain definition of new thing. Here's another quote from a book entitled Doing a New Thing by Brian Hewitt. This book contains articles by seven leaders of the charismatic church reflecting on the past, present, and future of the house church movement. Speaking of the origins of the house church or shepherding movement, he says, The leaders of the new churches all shared the same goal, the rebuilding or restoring of the present-day church to its New Testament splendor. And they shared the same conviction that God was actively at work in the last days to bring this to pass. Those Christians who had come to believe that a period of lukewarmness and black backsliding in the church would be a sign of the nearness of Christ's return were wrong. The era of the apostle, not the era of apostasy, was at hand. Here we see new thingology at its worst. Because of a false triumphalist interpretation of scripture, those who correctly foresee the, the great last days apostasy and tribulation are pronounced wrong or deluded. And a new idea is introduced, that a new breed of master apostles and prophets are to reappear in order to bring the revelations that will lead us on into purity, perfection, and dominion. Pentecostal Holiness New Thing The New Thingology began in the Pentecostal Holiness Camp meetings of the 19th century. Pentecostal preachers like Maria Woodworth Etter taught that God would send the latter reign of Joel II to, re to restore the church with signs and wonders before Jesus came. They expected a mighty revival before the rapture, but at that time, Pentecostalists still believed in conventional doctrine, the rapture, the Antichrist, the tribulation, and the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ. The new thing was that, as, a, as the above quote says, they now expected God to send, an, in spiritual outpouring, a new Pentecost, a revival that would rock the world. This idea has, <clears throat> has been floating around for centuries and periodically rears its head, usually when Christians become so desperate for, for spiritual renewal that they end up accepting a deceiving spirit instead of the Holy Spirit. I recently read evidence of all the false doctrine and Toronto-style manifestations taking place as early as 1886. Yeah. This astounded me, but what was interesting was the chain of events leading up to this particular diversion from Scripture. It was almost identical to today. Firstly, the desire for revival. Then, the disappointment when God could not be forced to convert the world according to their understanding. Next, the descent into occultism in seeking an alternative power source for the revival. This passage will illustrate my point. It is taken from a booklet written by G. H. Lang about the Azusa Street Pentecostal Renewal. Though sympathetic to Pentecostalism, Lang points out errors and abuses that arose at that time, many of them identical to today. He writes of the Church of God community in Tennessee that arose in 1886 from poor farming folk. A Baptist pastor came distressed in soul about the spiritual deadness prevailing. He devoted himself to prayer and study of the Bible. A few joined him. In 1886, these saw that no general awakening of the churches was to be expected. So nine persons formed themselves into a Christian union with the laudable but in part scripturally unwarranted objective to restore primitive Christianity and bring about the union of all denominations." Unquote. 
Having noted that the group was biblically literate, illiterate, illiterate, and that they did not abide by the biblical prophecies of end times apostasy that mitigated against worldwide revival, Lang goes on to say that their influence in numbers grew and they began to have manifestations at their meetings. He lists leaping, shouting, dancing, talking in tongues, and dancing in a spiritual trance or ecstasy. While the meetings were in progress, one after the other fell under the power of God. Unquote. Next, Lang writes deploring the carrying on at the Indian version of Azusa Street in Kunor on the Nilgiro Hills. He records damaging false prophecies that misled the entire group and also a terrific noise during the meetings of animals and bird noises, wild animal sounds, roaring, people groveling and rolling on the ground, with the ladies having to be covered by shawls to keep decent as they lay prostrate on the floor. Let me at once bring this totally up to date. Part of the Toronto scene, well documented and much recorded, is the roaring manifestation and the travailing as in birth throes. Have you ever wondered where this fits into the revival? Well, we need look no further than the New Thing passage of Isaiah that we have just been examining. Yes, New Thingology strikes again, giving credence to bizarre manifestations that actually have no place in the church. Read for yourself Isaiah 42, 1 through 16, especially verses 13 and 14. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yes, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now I will cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. nineteen oh six Azusa Street. The Pentecostal pioneers involved in the Azusa Street revivals also believed and taught this new thing. They believed another Pentecost had come to empower believers to go out and win the world for God. Because they believed the time had come for the latter rain outpouring, the new thing, they were caught up in missionary zeal to bring the nations to God and fulfill the prophecies. The place of tongues was central in their missionary efforts because it was believed that foreign languages were necessary to reach the pagan nations for God. If God would provide supernatural languages for preaching to the nations, then the gospel would be heard and understood by all. This was their belief, and the impetus for seeking after the gift of tongues. The fact that they succeeded in restoring the spiritual gift of tongues to the church is pretty much beside the point nowadays. However, the promised revival never happened. Just as with the present outpouring, the great revival never comes. When people are desperate for revival, power, signs, and wonders, they'll do or believe almost anything. They'll even justify the bizarre manifestations caused by the spirit of Toronto as the fulfillment of the new thing teachings. Latter Rain Revival at North Battleford. The Latter Rain Revival, at the time called the New Order of the Latter Rain, did not just spring form fully formed out of Canada without any previous teaching. No, it was the product of long years of muddled thinking and false revelations given to various individuals. To save going into the history of the movement at this point, I have appended in a separate document. See the appendix. In brief, the three greatest influences that led up to the 1940s latter rain outpouring were Franklin Hall, fasting in prayer for power and glory and immortality, William Branham, laying on of hands and words of knowledge, New Thing Teaching, the latter rain revival of Joel II and the restoration of the church through the apostles and prophets Compare Zion City and Apostolic Church of the UK. Franklin Hall, 
After Azusa Street, the gifts had died out again and people were feeling dry. Two world wars had passed without sight of revival for the nations turning to Christ. Denominational Pentecostalism had settled into a routine and had lost its original spark of excitement. Then in 1946, a man by the name of Franklin Hall started a series of fasting and prayer sessions for revival. Hall had involved himself in the healing revival of the 1940s, which ministers like Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, Gordon, Lindsay, and A.A. A. Allen rose to prominence. At the same time, a new evangelical awakening was bringing people like Bill Bright and Billy Graham into the circles of power and influence. William Brandon was also holding revival meetings, which in 1947 in Vancouver stirred the Canadian renewal movement that was to bring the latter reign to birth. Franklin Hall, therefore, existed at a time when many were looking for a route to renewed power and spiritual anointing. However, Hall's teaching, while offering a supposed easy route to power through prolonged fasting, had within it the seeds of heresy, and those seeds took root in many a young evangelist's heart. Hall's book on obtaining atomic power with God through fasting and prayer influenced many in the late 40s. Al Dagger points out in his Vengeance is Ours that Hall's book was publicly acknowledged as having a major influence on many of the faith healers. I have a copy of this book. I do too. And reading it makes one wonder about the scripture knowledge of Christians of that day. It is full of the most strange and heretical statements and reads more like an occult tract than a Christian book. Hall believed that by fasting for long periods, Christian received a power, a powerful anointing that led them to sinless perfection and immortality by stages of spiritual transformation. Stages of spiritual transformation. Some of his teachings were that perfected believers would experience power over the forces of gravity, that they could teleport to wherever they wished, like Cat Kerr. Their clothes would not wear out, they would have no body odor and never need to wash. They would never be sick, that an immortal substance from Christ would come upon their bodies, a golden substance visible to all that would glorify them and people would see and feel the fire of the Holy Spirit. That all must pray with open eyes. That body felt salvation, the fire of God, the glory, had to be applied to the body for 30 days and would purge out all sickness, tiredness, and weakness of the flesh. The doctrine of the corporate man-child was also in the first edition of the book. Wow. All the healing evangelists among them, William Branham and Catherine Coleman, were influenced by Franklin Hall and set out to look for atomic power with God through prayer and fasting. In fact, Ernest Houghton, George's brother, brother, later said that the latter Ring revival would never have been possible but for the brother Hall's teaching on prolonged fasting. Amongst those seeking for the new thing, accompanied by the power through prolonged fasting, was a group of missionaries at the Sharon Orphanage, North Battleford, Saskatchewan. They had also been fired into a search for revival by William Branham, whom they witnessed ministering in Vancouver in 1947. Reverend Herrick Holt at North Battleford was one of those desperately seeking and preaching a new thing, according to Isaiah 43. William Branham Branham was part of the healing revival of the 1940s and from the beginning had an unusual style, depending on revelations from his guardian angel to instruct him in healing. He taught on the latter reign of Joel II and believed it meant the Pentecostal and healing revival of his day. 
Thus, he too expected an end times revival. Branham was right in the line of descent from the old apostolic groups, for he believed firmly that denominations were not of God. In fact, he labeled them Babylon, and he taught that the church must be restored to its original unity and purity before the Lord returned. Later, Branham developed a non-Trinitarian doctrine, saying that the doctrine of the Trinity was the Babylonian hallmark of the denominations. As for his influence and connections, there were many. Ern Baxter, later to become one of the founders of the shepherding movement, was Branham's secretary from 1947-1953. We have already seen how Branham's meeting sparked off the latter rain revival in Canada. After it had begun, both he and Baxter attended the latter rain meetings at North Battleford. Paul Kane later to re-emerge as head of the Kansas City Prophets in 1989 and to become one of the guiding lights of the present renewal, also traveled with William Branham and called him the greatest prophet that ever lived. Pause. Are you kidding me? That ever lived. Go watch my William Branham uh, video and you will want to throw up. Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest man that ever lived, and a prophet, I'm sure. William Branham. North Battleford Meetings. It was because of the teachings of Franklin Hall and the healing meetings of William Branham that three men gathered for revival meetings at North Battleford in Canada. They were George Houghton, Percy Hunt, and Herrick Holt. George Houghton set up in the Bethel, Bi Bethel Bible Institute of Saskatchewan in 1935 but was asked to resign in 1947. Percy Hunt resigned from Bethel at the same time in sympathy with George Houghton in 1947. George and his brother Ernie and Percy Hunt joined Herrick Holt, who owned a plot of land and had set up the Sharon School and Orphanage in Battleford, North Battleford, Saskatchewan. Here is a fascinating fact. The first latter rain meetings for revival were held in a little building on the airport at North Battleford in Canada. The renewed revival has also, in public at least, gained a reputation for starting in the Toronto Airport Vineyard, a little building by the airport. Perhaps it's pure co coincidence, or perhaps not. Herrick Holt was already praying for the new thing and was expecting revival. The year before, he had read Fa Franklin Hall's book and was fasting as recommended for the atomic power Joined by the Hawtons and Percy Hunt and by the Bible school students, they fasted and prayed, some for over a month, for revival to break out. Then in February 1948, the power fell. Prophecies were given that a great, unstoppable new move of revival was about to begin and would lead to God's end-time harvest. One unique factor in the latter rain move was the impartation of the Holy Spirit and gifts through laying on of hands. Previously, Pentecostals had taught in line with the holiness groups that soul-searching repentance in a time of preparation, tarrying, was necessary before anyone received the Holy Spirit. Now, however, at Battleford, as at Toronto, the power was being passed from one to another without a pause. People from all over the country started traveling to Canada to get the power, which was passed on through laying on of hands. Rather than healing, prophecy became the most prominent feature, and prophecy laid down the new revelations governing the revival. Pause. All this laying on of hands and transferring power. I am just starting to really realize what, what this is all about. But people are getting some kind of an experience through laying on of hands. And maybe it's like a fire tunnel or one of those Heidi Baker kind of laying on of hands. And they are transferring something. They aren't even hearing the gospel. They're just getting zapped. For instance, it was promised that 
If my people reverence my name, my presence, and my house, I will begin to restore that which has been lost in the church. The group came to believe, as others before them had done, that the restoration of the church would be accomplished through latter-day apostles and prophets, through laying on of hands for the gift of the Spirit, and through the revelations given in prophecy. J. Preston Eby later summed up the teachings of the latter reign as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit which shall bring the fullness a company of overcoming sons of God who have come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ to actually dethrone Satan casting him out of the heavenlies and finally binding him in the earthlies bringing hope of deliverance and life to all the families of earth. This great work of the Spirit shall usher a people into full redemption, free from the curse, sin, sickness, death, and carnality. These new revelations that became the doctrines of the new order were established by prophecies and the choice of apostles and other ministers was made through prophecies. This recalls the Gnostic teachings discussed in Part 1. Once again, prophecies, visions, and words were accepted as foundational for this move. Eventually, the prophecies were exalted above the Word of God. Also, personal prophecies were given over people's lives and ministries were destroyed as a result of accepting these. Mm. All of this and more led to the latter rain movement falling into disrepute and ultimately being rejected by the Pentecostal denominations. Wow. Yes, I can say in my life a long time ago personal prophecies governed at some time at some points major decisions major life decisions in my life sadly the heresy rejected not surprisingly the classic pentecostal denominations recognized the latter rain teachings as heresy and eventually in 1949 they officially banned latter rain teachers from their pulpits the reasons they gave were these teachings were causing division and confusion in the body there is an overemphasis on laying on of hands for impartation of the gifts and power of the spirit in 1949 the erroneous teaching that the church is restored by present-day apostles and prophets. New order teaching about confession of sin to man, deliverance of demons claiming to have powers and rights that only belong to Christ. Yes, pause. That's what they all do. They all claim authority, power, dominion, this thing and that thing. And it's all, it's God's, it's Christ's characteristics and his powers and that they are claiming to have it's all back to little gods sorry <clears throat> next one erroneous teaching concerning the impartation of a gift of languages as special equipment for missionary work extreme and unbiblical practice of imparting personal leadings by means of personal prophecy other heretical doctrines and distortions of scripture. However, despite this setback, the latter rain teachings continued to be popular amongst certain groups and several breakaway movements began from the 1950s, including The Walk in California, led by John Robert Stevens. That was a cult. Oh. Anyway, others affected by latter rain teachings were Bill Britton, James Beale, and David Ebaugh, J. Presterson, e. Ebby, Ralph Mahoney, Gerald Durstein, Carlton Spencer, and also John Poole, once part of the Fort Lauderdale Shepherding Group. 
But apart from Sunship Group's offshoots of the Latter Ring Revival, there were many more individuals who simply moved on into the charismatic movement and became bit players there. This is really how the heresies became legitimized within the restoration groups of the, of the United Kingdom at least. Restoration churches are now the most numerically strong and the most influential of any group in the UK. <clears throat> George Warnock One man who was hugely impressed by the latter rain teachings went on to provide a book that stands alongside Franklin Hall's Atomic Power as seminal to the movement. The man was George Warnock and the book was The Feast of Tabernacles. It was written in the late 1940s and reprinted in 1951 by Bill Britton. The book proposes that the three major feasts of Israel are the stages of development of the church. Passover was deliverance from sin. Pentecost was the former reign or individual empowering. Feast of Tabernacles will be when God indwells his people spiritually and causes them to rule. Oh boy. This book lays out all the major doctrines of the corporate Christ, the glorified body, unity, the second Pentecost, restoration, everything. It is sobering, therefore, to read this book and discover that many of the doctrines that have been adopted by the charismatic movement, the restoration churches, and by the current renewal leadership, New Apostolic Reformation, hello, just before the latter rain revival broke out, George Warnock was acting as Ern Baxter's personal secretary and right-hand man, so Ern Baxter was doubly involved. Ern Baxter said in 1975, We are talking of man coming into the fullness of his self-realization, into his ultimate destiny as the image of God. This beloved one came to become the pattern son to become the ideal man after which we he would pattern a whole community of redeemed ones. What he was in his incarnate power in life, they become in their corporate power in life. <clears throat> God's purpose is not to redeem a bunch of people to sit at a bus stop and wait for the bus to come along and get them out of the world's mess. He came as king so that under their authority, the redeemed community might become the means whereby he would establish God's sovereign right in his own redeemed earth. We have individual salvation, but in the nation we have corporate salvation. God's people are going to start to exercise rule and they're going to take dominion over the power of Satan. As the rod of his strength goes out of Zion, he will change legislation. He will chase the devil off the face of God's earth, and God's people will bring about God's purposes and God's reign. Wow. God's people will bring about God's reign. Ern Baxter and John Poole, the son of Fred Poole, an early latter rain believer, joined the Fort Lauderdale group who introduced shepherding to the UK. Their magazine, New Wine, was the charismatic magazine of the 1970s. Charles Simpson was another of that group. He said of himself, he denied the rapture of the church in 1972. He affirms the dominion mandate. He quotes Psalm 110 about Christ not returning until the church has put all enemies under his feet, including death. And says, in 1972, I received a revelation of the Lordship of Christ and the Kingdom of God as a current reality. I saw Christ reigning now and teaching us to do so as well. I have thoroughly embraced this truth. That's the end of this part. I love him.
because there's nothing like him. And if you're bored with the Bible, it's because you're boring and you're ignorant. Amen. Run. There's just one name that can keep you out of hell, and it's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus.